Thank you. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the psychology of scarcity, the psychology that comes with not having enough. Poverty is the most uh, obvious example. And throughout the decades, the social sciences have been impressed by the fact that the poor make very bad decisions. And the question is, why is that? And uh, probably the most relevant example I can give you today, there are many, but one is uh, payday lending. Uh, payday lending is a, a remarkable story. You, uh, if you want to pay day loan, you go to a place that gives you small amounts, two or three hundred dollars for two weeks until your paycheck arrives. You have to have a paycheck, you have to have a bank. Uh, and you pay a lot of interest for that loan. You basically borrow three hundred dollars for which you pay somewhere between 20, 25 percent. Uh, if you compute the APR, the yearly interest, it comes to somewhere between 400 and 1,000 percent that you pay for this loan. Uh, we know that these loans hurt you. So basically what happens is, think about it, you need some money urgently, you borrow 250, two weeks from now you owe me 300, you're not any richer than you were last time, that 300 becomes even more of an offense, you have to borrow again. The data is that people who resort to payday loans borrow on the average of between eight to 12 times a year. Recent evidence suggests that up to 75% of a loan taken goes to pay the previous one. You're just becoming a money pump and you're in, in debt trap. And it hurts you. There's data that shows that when, you, when payday loans are available, people are less likely to be able to pay their bills, less likely to resort to medical treatment, etc. And is this a successful venture? Unbelievably so. I have you some data here. Uh, there are more payday loan and check cashing stores in America today than there are McDonald's, Burger King, Sears, JCPenney, and Target stores combined. So this is a massively expensive loan that the poor resort to. It hurts them. It's super popular. Why? Um, there have been many attempts to try to understand this. They range from lack of education, lack of understanding, a lack of self-control, myopia, a wrong culture, etc. We are trying a different uh, tack on this. We want to claim that the psychology that comes from scarcity, there's actually psychology that comes from not having enough, and that that psychology, when it emerges, when you don't have enough, yields these very characteristic behaviors that, are, that can be very hurtful. Uh, to give you a sense of how that feels, uh, I'm going to use a metaphor. It's the packing metaphor. It's a suitcase packing metaphor. And think about your budget as a suitcase. Um, two friends. One has a large suitcase with slack in it. The other one has a very small suitcase that's very tightly packed. That feels very different. The one with the large suitcase tosses in all the things that she needs. She might throw a few other things that are of lower utility, less important to her, but might still be serving a purpose. But she leaves some slack for unintended, uh, unexpected events and, and travels. The one with a very tight suitcase that's very tightly packed can't even put all the things that are really necessary. It just doesn't fit, let alone the things that matter less. She needs to start struggling, doing trade-offs. What should I put in? What shouldn't I? Should I put the sneakers or the raincoat? What should I do? She's dealing with a much more complicated problem, technically, computationally. She has a very hard time leaving any slack in the suitcase for unexpected moments. And she has to make trade-offs that require a lot of attention. I don't really care about the size of the coat because I have room in my suitcase. You, with a very tight suitcase, really need to know, is the coat bigger or smaller than my shoes? I am traveling with slack. If I walk the streets of New York and I see a pair of shoes I like, I ask, is the price right? And if it is, I buy them and I toss them in my suitcase. You, with a tight suitcase, find the shoes, ask, is the price right? And now you ask yourself, well, what do I take out of my suitcase to make room for these shoes? A much more complicated task. So the argument is when you live under scarcity with this very tight suitcase, you're constantly in trade-off thinking mode, and you're concerned with the actual size of items and what that might mean for you. Uh, simple data, if you will. If you ask people of lower and less low income, do you think about what you might not be able to, to buy instead when you buy a TV or a toaster? Sure enough, the low income report thinking much more often about trade-offs where they might not be able to buy. What about knowledge of prices? You know, I, I walk the streets of America every day, and I buy books, and I buy lunches, and I take cabs. I don't think about what I'm not going to buy instead, and I don't even really care or remember if the book was $17 or $16, if the cab cost $8 or $9, it's all the same to me. If you have a very tight suitcase, if you are a low-income American, you need to think about the trade-offs every time you buy anything above a muffin. And so if you live in Roxbury and you receive food stamps, you live in a place where food is actually more expensive than if you traveled elsewhere. Now you have to ask a complicated question. Do I buy my food here or do I take a taxi since I don't have a car and buy it somewhere else? For that, you need to know how much is a taxi. 
I don't really care how much a taxi is exactly. You need to know. So we go to South Station in Boston, stop people, ask them, by the way, when you walk into a cab, what does the meter start from when you, start, when you take the cab? What's the reading? And we divide them by reported income into high and low. We took cabs, we chose cabs carefully because nobody's going to say that the poor ride cabs more than the rich, yet they're three times more likely to know the price of the cab than the rich are. They're just more attentive, more careful, and have to solve this problem on a constant basis. The interesting thing about this model of scarcity is it doesn't have to be about money. So many people in this room are time poor just the way our subjects are money poor. You have a tight suitcase on your time. Some people who have more time, say you work nine to five on a regular job, if I come and ask you, do you want to go to the movies tonight? Just like the shoes, you say, do I want to see this movie? Yes, no, and sure, I'll go. If I go to some of you who are working much harder and say, do you want to go to the movies tonight? You have to say, do I want to see the movie? And what do I not do tonight that I'll have to do tomorrow? I'll have to borrow money from tomorrow, uh, sorry, time from tomorrow, potentially at high rate, because it's going to be hard to find that time tomorrow in order to go to this movie. So you're packing time. Temptations. When you're poor, when your suitcase is very tight, things that ought to be regular, taking cabs, buying pizzas, become a temptation you might need to resist. You're constantly resisting temptations a lot more than the rich are, and there's a lot of evidence that resisting temptation is simply depleting. It fatigues you. It's hard to resist temptation, and the poor, those who experience scarcity, do that a lot. Well, um, the, the, sorry, I'm jumping in. The, the rich have very similar time temptations that they have to think about. Just like there is a regular pizza for the person in America who might not be able to afford it with the poor, think about spending two hours with your kids, playing Monopoly. That ought to be a completely standard activity. If you are time poor, all of a sudden that becomes something you think about. You trade off, you worry about, you might not be able to afford. It becomes a luxury. Finally, one more, indulgences. A lot of the literature on the poor critiques the poor for being in debt that they cannot pay, nonetheless buying small luxuries, sneakers, iPods, etc. And that somehow looks wrong, but if you understand the psychology of indulgences, it's a different story. I mean, I cannot pay the debt that's true, but now I can do something that's nice to me. Think about you guys, how many people in this room are sitting on deadlines that you'll not be able to respect, yet what are you doing here schmoozing with me? Go back. <laughs> and do a few more minutes, but that's just not the psychology and how it works. And so that's part of this issue of scarcity and how you deal with it. Okay, um, let me give you some quick studies that we've done. It's hard to make our students money poor, but it's very easy to make them time poor. We have subjects come to a lab where they're gonna play Family Feud. I assume most of you know how the game works. You have to guess the answers, they get into it. They collect points, which then get translated into money, which they actually get paid, so they wanna do well. We randomly assign them into rich and poor. Some have more time, 50 seconds around. They have more time to think and play. Others have very little, only 15 seconds around. In addition, between these two groups, some have the ability to borrow at, at, at high rates. So every time you use an extra second now, if you're into the game, you think you know the answer, you want two more seconds, you can borrow, but then you pay with two extra seconds for every second you borrowed, so you pay back at interest. Or you're in a group that cannot borrow. So we have the rich and the poor, Able to borrow, not able to borrow, you play the game, what do you find? You find that the rich, students who have enough time, don't borrow very much. This is not an attractive rate, it's predatory lending. But occasionally they do and it doesn't hurt them. The poor, those who are poor for time, living under time scarcity, borrow more frequently, pay the high interest rate, manage to finish fewer rounds and get substantially fewer points. So what you're seeing here, is people borrowing under scarcity at predatory lending rates and hurting themselves. Except that these are not the poor of America who you can criticize for being uneducated, myopic, wrong culture. These are Princeton students. They're not myopic. They got into Princeton. They don't have self-control problems. They're functioning under scarcity and replicating the effects that you see among those who experience money scarcity. Um, this has big influence on our lives because if you're poor, and you're constantly in a packing, problem-solving mode, it's very distracting and it's very fatiguing. Here we go to a mall in New Jersey. We ask people to participate in a study. They agree. They sit in front of a computer. You get hypothetical financial problems. Your car breaks down, it's going to take some money to fix. While you're thinking about how you're going to fix this problem, we give you a couple of classic um, cognitive tests that have been used in the literature, uh, in, in experimental studies quite a bit. 
the cognitive uh, control task is sort of a divided attention executive control. Think about it as divided as driving. It's how well you can manage. You have to answer same side if it's a heart, opposite side if it's a flower. It's very confusing. We know for a fact after many studies, if you're tired or distracted, you do less well. You're slower and you make more errors. So that's a driving test. The other one, the Raven's progressive matrices, is basically an IQ test. It's used. These actual questions are used in SAT and GRE tests. It captures working memory and intelligence. So these subjects now got these problems, either a hard problem where the car is going to cost a lot or, a, or an easy problem where it's going to cost not too much to fix. They, answer, they, they play these games and independently we get a, re, a, a reading of their self-reported annual household income. We divide them by median split into rich and poor. And let's see how they do on these tests, on these games. If you look at the rich, whether they get the easy or the hard financial problem, they do equally well. If you look at the poor in Jersey Mall, when the problem is easy, when a car is not hard to fix, they do just as well as the rich. When the problem is challenging, they are driving less well. And the argument is when you're poor and driving in America, there are a lot of challenging problems in the back of your mind all the time. The other question, the rich, when you look at the IQ test, whether it's an easy or hard problem, they do equally well. The poor do completely well when the problem is easy. They are less intelligent when there's a difficult problem that concerns them in the back of their minds. So when you're going around with difficulties packing, this actually impacts your performance in ways that are detectable and consequential. You could say the rich and the poor, it's a problem, it's different. One is more stressed than the other. One is more educated than the other. We've controlled for all that. Nonetheless, the dream would be, can we show this in a single subject, not different? We found a solution. These are sugarcane farmers in India. They have uh, their sugarcane harvest is once a year. Because these people are living under great scarcity, they fail to smooth. They end up being poor before the harvest and rich after, or after they still harvest. So we go to the same people now, four months apart, just before harvest, just after harvest, and give them these questions, and they do less well. They look poor before the harvest, and they do better. The same individual, smarter after the harvest. Suggesting, again, that to some extent, your ability, your intelligence, your ability to drive, all depends on the psychology that emerges under scarcity that makes life just a lot more difficult to, to deal with. So, the irony of scarcity. The, the poor have much higher, more difficult problems to solve. Their, problem cha their packing challenges are extreme and persistent. They face many more temptations by sheer fact that they cannot afford things that otherwise would be considered standard. And they're constantly under scarcity, which is depleting. At the same time, they are in situations that make the solution much more hard, much more difficult to come by. Society stereotypes are less helpful. They are stressed and depleted from the, idea, from the need to solve their problems. And as a result, they fail much more often. And why is this important? It's important because I think to some extent, we policymakers have failed to appreciate the impact and the relevance of scarcity on people's lives. And a design of policy that alleviates scarcity, makes it more possible, to deal with and that provides aids might actually elicit behaviors that are more capable and more competent than we've seen so far. So that's the, that's the program. Thank you.